nice it'd be if we can try everything I'm serious let's make a list and just begin what about danger so what what about risk let's climb this mountain before we cross that bridge cause I'm restless I'm restless I'm restless for whatever comes next how wonderful to see a smile on your face it caused farewell tears for a welcome home parade a secret handshake between me and my one life i'll find the silver lining no matter what the price cause i'm home I'm hungry for whatever comes next Let me tell you another secret of the trade It feels like sinking when I'm standing in one place So I look to the future and I book another flight When everything feels heavy I've learned to travel light But I wanna be here Truly be here To watch the ones that I love bloom And I wanna make This is our Broad Street Ministry virtual worship service. My name is Reverend Laura Coley, and I serve as the pastor here at BSM. Today marks the seventh of our Lenten Easter Enneagram-inspired You Are preaching series, where we're exploring vital messages that we all need to hear. And today's message is, you are free. You are free. Like with our previous services in this series, we are connecting all of the music and readings to a particular Enneagram personality type. And today is all about the Enneagram type sevens. Sevens are known as the enthusiasts, the charmers, the life of the parties, the adventure seekers, the glass half full, drink up as much of life as you can, adrenaline seeking, sunshiny balls of energy. These folks are the perfect people to help us continue our Easter celebration. We want to thank you for joining us for worship today and this You Are journey. Uh, we absolutely would not be us without you and without all of you. 
Let me give you a little orientation to our worship service so you know what to expect. Uh, you can find a number of links that will be helpful for you below the YouTube live stream, including a link to the online bulletin where you can follow along with all of the amazing music and readings. You can also find a link to where you can make an online financial offering and a link to where you can submit your prayers and introduce yourself to this faith community if you'd like. You should know that this Sunday and every Sunday, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. This sacred practice we find extremely grounding for us. And so you're invited at this time to find some kind of bread, some kind of drink, anything you have in your house. I have this little roll and some Dr. Pepper because I threw out the old juice in my house. Anything you have, we're gonna trust that God can work through ordinary things and ordinary people like you and me in this sacred practice. At this time, we want to invite you to reflect on our worship question of the day, which is a two-parter. The question is, when do you feel free? When do you feel free and who do you feel free around? When do you feel free and who do you feel free around? We may have different thoughts about what being free feels like. Uh, we would love to know your thoughts. Feel free to reflect on that. And if you'd like, uh, share your answers in the chat. At this time, one of our spectacular pastoral fellows this season, Rachel Johnson, will lead us in acknowledging God's presence right in our place. Friends, let us worship God. Hey Broad Street, my name is Rachel Johnson. I am one of your pastoral fellows and I'm gonna lead us in acknowledging God's presence wherever you might find yourself today. So just take a moment, center yourself wherever that is, whether that's a train or your couch or wherever you find yourself. Just take a deep breath, close your eyes if that feels comfortable or watch some nature videos I'm about to show you uh, and be at peace as we hear this opening quotation from Anne of Green Gables. Why must people kneel down to pray? If I really wanted to pray, I will tell you what I'd do. I would go out into a great big field all alone or in the deep, deep woods and I'd look up into the sky, up up, up into that lovely blue sky that looks as if there was no end to its blueness. And then I'd just feel a prayer. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter where you've come from or what your state of mind is right now, you are welcome here. There wouldn't be an us without you. And God is already waiting everywhere that we find ourselves in this moment for us to gather and to worship. So come as you are, bring yourself, your whole self, your faith, your doubts, everything in between, and know that God is here with us, that you as you are will be met by a loving God and a loving community. Let's praise and worship and dance and sing and do whatever the Spirit moves us to do together today.
Our dancing in the rain wasn't a denial of the storms that had moved in on black people that week. It was a dare, an indigent stand of confidence in the midst of this malignant monsoon we call systematic racism. Our laughter was a way to say, you can't steal our joy. To anyone who dared deny our humanity, author and scholar Imani Perry, in a recent article for The Atlantic, captured this feeling well. Joy is not found in the absence of pain and suffering. It exists through it. Blackness is an immense and defiant joy. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus watched. Oh, when he watched. Oh, when he watched. He washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. And we had just the loveliest seminary intern, uh, Ellen White, uh, who we then were never able to see again in person. Yay! But it's beautiful that we're able to, like, 
bring you back and make this full circle. Um, uh, Ellen uh, sees herself as an Enneagram 7. I keep joking that I think we scare away 7s from our congregation. So the fact that we have a 7 in our midst is beautiful and wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's an absolute treat to bring you back and for you to be able to share your wisdom as in, you're in your final year uh, at Princeton Theological Seminary. So the Enneagram, how did you get introduced to it? How, why do you connect with this Enneagram 7 thing? What's it about for you? Tell me it all. Go for it. Sure thing. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, I learned about the Enneagram for the first time in seminary. I don't think I'd ever heard of it before. And it's so um, it may be a little cliche that it's associated with seminary or for some folks like church experiences. Um, but yeah. I was told I was a seven pretty flat out by a new friend who's a very dear friend. And I was like, as I was learning about the Enneagram, I was like, I don't know what I am. So how can you know what I am? Don't put me in a box. I'm not a seven. Um, and then proceeded to mistype myself as a two. I took a test, um, and uh, as a lot of folks can be mistyped, but especially as a two, as like a woman and a woman in the totally. church. It's yep. happening. Yep. It happens. Um, so I even went back to that friend and was like, ha ha, <laughs> I'm not a seven, I'm a two. Um, anyway, the the it's, it was this sort of tumbling journey of learning about the Enneagram, mistyping myself, um, and then it was maybe later in, in a year's time or something like that as Ryan from Sleeping At Last was starting to put out these songs and these podcasts that I was talking about, um, twos and sevens with a friend and we were on a road trip and she was like, let's just play this Enneagram 7 podcast from Sleeping At Last. Um, and so the song that's that's tucked into the, the podcast uh, was just all very clarifying and meaningful to me. And I remember feeling very seen and like realizing, oh, oh, okay, wow, I'm I'm a seven, like 100%. Um, and so I'm very fond of, of that song uh, from Sleeping At Last. Um, some of the, the little things that make me feel like a seven um, is that enthusiasm, that sort of definitive enthusiasm of a seven being really excitable about a lot of different things, um, a sort of desire for fun and pleasure and also a real posture of joy, a uh, sense of adventure and, and spontaneity. Um, I think it's it's maybe Chris Hewart's um, in the podcast for Sleeping At Last, uh, talks about like a calculated impulsivity. I really like those words mm -hmm. um, because it touches on like where seven sits in the head triad um, that there is this sense of like silliness and spontaneity, but it's, it's quite calculated and planned. Like there's this planning, this desire to plan what's next. Um, and so a lot of that really resonates with me uh, connecting to, to the seven ness, seven ness. All of that. So we just exited uh, the season of Lent, um, and I feel like sevens probably aren't here for Lent. Uh, <laughs> sevens are ones who are like, no, why would I give up chocolate? Why would I give up anything that's great in life? I want to drink up as much as of life as possible. Uh, and uh, so what do you think may be a helpful practice for sevens to practice during a season like Lent or in life in general? What might be a helpful spiritual practice for the seven enthusiasts out there yeah you really hit the nail on the head i was gonna say the question of like what should a seven give up is like a nightmare of a question for a seven because uh I, and i didn't quite hit on this before but this also really resonates with me as a seven is this avoidance of pain mm -hmm. um and so we desire to avoid pain um, there's this sense of not wanting to be deprived of things that, that uh, we feel passionate about or give us pleasure. Um, I should speak in terms of me, not us, but I think it's this shared sense of, of sevens. Um, yeah, so it's hard to think in terms of like deprivation or giving up, but um, I was realizing that as I was learning about being a seven and learning about FOMO, um, the fear of missing out, um, that that could really be tied into like a Lenten mm -hmm. practice or something like that of kind of giving up 
FOMO um, and saying yes to everything. Like there's, that's a tendency I notice in myself is to take on a lot for a fear of missing out, for a fear of maybe being excluded or something like that. So I want to, to say yes to all the things, to accept all the invitations um, and to, to not miss out on things. So there's the sense of, of giving that up and taking on what an old therapist of mine might say, JOMO. The joy of missing out. Yes. Um, Relax, hang out at home, watch a movie. Yeah. You got it. This yep. like this contentment of, of being able to say no um, and yeah, maybe miss out on something and being content with that. Um, and so as I was thinking about that and then remembering um, again, Chris Hewart's author of The Sacred Enneagram, if I didn't already mention that, lovely book. Mm-hmm. Um, notes or taught me that the virtue of sevens is sobriety Mm. um which is really interesting and and yeah to ponder my first association with sobriety is like uh alcohol you know and and chris teaches that it's less about that association and more about an acceptance of like what you have being enough Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, I feel like that so beautifully ties in with that sense of um, like FOMO and JOMO. Um, so even though I'm terrible at Lenten practices because I like, yeah, I'm, I either don't want to give something up or when I think of taking something on, I think of like four new hobbies that I'd like to have mm-hmm. um, and then they all fall away. So I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at, at Lenten disciplines, but I challenge myself and, and invite other sevens um, into, into a, a spiritual practice of, of sobriety or something that looks like that, of, um, of just being satisfied with, with what you have and feeling enough. Yeah, it's been interesting. We've uh, our our crew are on our faith team right now have talked about how all of the numbers we thought that all of the numbers could just say you are enough, but the enoughness is different for ones you are enough without having to be perfect you know uh fives you are enough without knowing everything and like sevens you are enough without having to do all of the things without being the life of the party without constantly having to be whatever (laughs) yes so and and that yeah we could have just called this whole series you are enough i love that um so uh, the, one of my favorite things about sevens is y'all are just charmers. Like you could charm your way out of a ticket. Like you're just charismatic and lovely. And I think Jesus had some of that charm. I bet you he, like, he wasn't trying to like, uh, you know, he wasn't a, a used car salesman, but he was, he was a definitely, a, yeah, yeah. He was definitely, he was a charmer. Uh, I, how else maybe do you see Jesus as a uh, Enneagram seven type? Where do you where do you see that connection? Yeah, um, the first things that I think of, Jesus had a lot of friends. <laughs> he had twelve friends. It's too many. <laughs> Jesus brought brought the wine. Jesus brought the wine to the party, he turning did. that water into wine. He really and and he loved to party. You know, yeah. we, we talk about that, but you know. Uh, He accepted a lot of invitations to dinner parties from, you know, hoity-toity people and social outcasts. He was like, you're having a party? I'll be there. Um, So, yeah, those are are the initial things. It's friends and wine um, comes to mind when I think of Jesus as a seven. Um, But I also, I, I was really touched by Richard Rohr's um, reflection in his chapter um, about the pain that Jesus suffered and and in the Gospel of Matthew how um, how he turns away this, uh, declines this painkiller and lives and suffers and dies through through this pain um, into Easter joy Um, and I never want to like instrumentalize pain I am seven, but I think in general, it's just a a good thing that this is not an instrument to joy, um, but rather just a reality of life Um, and sort of speaks to this this COVID world, right? Is that like, this is just a a reality of the way things are right now um, and it's painful and and, uh, it involves things that we grieve very truly. but, but we move through it to an even deeper uh, sense of joy 
And so I love that, that Jesus models, models that and sevens live it. Um, and it's, you know, speaks to the truth of pain and the, and the true depths of joy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, that model that kind of Jesus offers. He is trying to drink up of as much of life as possible. He's even called a, a drunkard, a lush, uh, a glutton by by some of his, you know, naysayers. He's trying to enjoy as much of life as possible, but that includes the painful parts as well. Like he he's willing to go through that. He is trying to get truly all that life has to offer, and that is kind of the movements, the invitation for sevens and for all of us is that life is not just abundant. Life is not just dream drinking up the good. It is drinking up it all. Um, so I love that. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for chatting with us. And I'm so excited for what comes next in your life and the ministry that you do in your life. And I'm so grateful that we got to be a small piece of that. So thank you for chatting with us. Thank uh, you, Laura. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Hi, Broad Street. Our scripture lesson this afternoon comes from the 20th chapter of John, verses 19 to 28. Listen to the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please join with me in prayer? Let us pray. Loving God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. God of Ellen and Anthony and LeBrian and Greg and Lauren and Jess. We ask in the sacredness of this moment and the sacredness of all of our places that you quiet every voice within us except your own and startle us with your joy and your truth. We offer all these prayers in Jesus' name, who is resurrected this day. Amen. On this second Sunday of the Easter season, we find the disciples hiding behind a locked door, still terrified that the political and religious authorities would now do to them what they had done to their leader just days before. 
And while I'm fairly annoyed that the disciples do not seem to trust Mary Magdalene's witness of Jesus' resurrection enough to go running into the streets in celebration, or even to simply keep the door unlocked and open so that their Alive Again leader might be able to walk through it, I can appreciate how the disciples' fear only provides Jesus with another opportunity to appear to humanity in our distress. The resurrected Jesus appears to the disciples, simultaneously embodied and also able to miraculously traverse locked doors. He appears to them to show them his wounds, to give them the Holy Spirit, and to set them free from all that keeps them bound and burdened and confined. And on this second Sunday of our now second annual pandemic Easter season, I can imagine that many of us can resonate with the disciples' sense of confinement and restraint. Now, our sense of restraints that we have experienced during the various stages of this pandemic lockdown has not only been for our personal safety and protection, but also for the protection of our neighbors and our community. There has been value to our restriction and confinement even beyond our own personal survival. And yet, and hear me out here, I want out. Please let me out. <laughs> Before our interview, our former seminary intern, Ellen White, told me that she had a running list of concerts that her FOMO-ridden heart wanted to see, and I have a running list of places that I want to visit. Beaches and mountains and drive-in theaters, immersive art installations and national parks and restaurants and rail biking and minor league baseball stadiums and entire countries. I want to see them all. My thirst for travel and adventure and newness feels unquenchable. After a year of so much pain and confusion and sameness, I want to, I need to be safely let out into the world. <laughs> And while some adventures here and there will undoubtedly be valuable for me, I know deep down that my eat, pray, loving it across the world will not be ultimately meaningful or satisfying to me. Because deep down, I know that that's not the kind of freedom I'm truly looking for. I think in America, especially among people with various forms of privilege, we are misled, even deluded, into believing that freedom means you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. For some, freedom means being able to pursue the things that bring you joy, even if those things cause others pain. For some, Freedom means never being held accountable to others, never having to give up something for the good of another. But here's the thing, that's not what freedom truly is. Freedom is not a libertarian utopia or a perpetual Disneyland vacation. And as the disciples learn, freedom is not merely an unlocked and open door. No, the resurrected Jesus shows us that freedom is a relationship. It's being seen and accepted as you fully are in partnership and communion and commitment to one another. It's the willingness to witness the mistakes and shortcomings of others and ourselves and to forgive and be forgiven. Freedom, true freedom, is found in Jesus revealing his wounds to Thomas and being embraced not merely for his extravagance, but also in all of his pain, he is embraced as my Lord and my God. That's freedom. During the past week, while listening to our episode for our podcast, Small Group, we heard Austin Channing Brown describe the kind of freedom she experiences as a black woman in American black churches. She says... In the black church, it's not unusual to experience every emotion. So if you go to the service and you don't laugh and cry and dance, 
and have a really rich conversation and maybe have one conversation that made you feel angry, then you probably didn't go to church that day. But I think for black people, that's freedom because we so often have to navigate a world in which we must be in control of our emotions at all times. For Austin, liberation and freedom are found in spaces where others allow her to be fully herself, where she's invited to live her full, robust life, all the while committing her life to not impinging on the life of another. So rarely do we offer black, indigenous people of color this kind of freedom in our country freedom to be fully themselves. So rarely do people with privilege and authority value their personal freedom as much as the freedom of oppressed persons. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose martyr day was celebrated this past week, reflected extensively about the difference between seeing freedom as the absence of something and freedom as the commitment to something. He wrote, freedom is not a quality of humanity, nor is it an ability, a capacity, a kind of being that somehow flares up in us. Anyone investigating humanity to discover freedom finds nothing of it. Why? Because freedom is not a quality which can be revealed. It's not a possession, a presence, an object, nor is it a form of existence, but it is a relationship and nothing else. In truth, freedom is a relationship between two persons. Being free means being free for another, because the other has bound me to them. Only in relationship with the other am I free. We, friends, are not free from pain, struggle, heartache, etc. We are free to walk alongside others in their joy and their pain and have others walk alongside us. Now, this is supposed to be an Enneagram 7 inspired sermon, and so. I'm going to keep things short and to the point because I know y'all have many adventures waiting for you and also because I'm really tired after Easter. We entitled this service, You Are Free, in part because we knew that this core message would speak to the soul of our enthusiastic adventurers out there. If you are someone who loves spontaneity and newness, adrenaline and anticipation and joy and time with lots of other people. If you find God in the inspiring, mountaintop, sunshiny experiences of life, then we want to affirm that you are free. You are free to drink up as much as this life has to offer. And if you are someone who doesn't like to feel boxed in or tied down, if you'd rather avoid heavy conversations and emotions, if you can automatically reframe the negative parts of life into something positive, then we want to again affirm you that you are free. You are free to be fully yourself. Not just the charming, uplifting, energetic parts of yourself. You are free to be sad. <laughs> You are free to not be the life of the party. You are free to truly experience your pain and to not always look on the bright side of things. You are free to commit yourself to someone and something and to find purpose and fulfillment in those commitments. You, oh my dear hearts, you are free to find God in the unavoidable suffering of this life and to trust that God has wounds to show you too. And while sure, I am longing for some spontaneous adventure of my own, 
the good news of this Easter day is that we are all invited into the freedom of a relationship with God and with others and with the fullness of our own selves. And that's some pretty good Easter news. Amen. So last week during communion, I mentioned how much I love how the Gospels depict Jesus as extremely hungry after the resurrection. His love of a good meal becomes this kind of quintessential marker for him. And as we see in our scripture passage for today, Jesus' wounds also serve as a key way for the disciples to identify him. And so Jesus is simultaneously this powerful, larger-than-life figure who loves a dinner party and somehow miraculously has 12 friends in his 30s. And he is also a person who is vulnerably willing to reveal his wounds to those around him. Jesus, in his life and in his resurrection, invites us into the fullness of our lives. We are free to sparkle and to mourn. All of who we are is holy, and we recognize that all of who we are is welcome at this communion table. So friends, come. Come participate in the abundant life that exists right here and right now, not in some far away mountaintop adventure, but come and drink up all that life has to offer in this moment. Come. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise.
our prayers of the people is once again led by our talented pastoral fellow, Emma Claire Martin. And with that, friends, let us pray. This is a prayer for the sevens. The sevens who don't sit still long enough for someone to pray for them. The sevens who don't need your pews and your pulpits because their lives are already a liturgy of playfulness. Each breath a hymn of adventure, each plane ticket a rosary. But I promise you, your muscles will not atrophy. If you just sit here with us for three minutes and fifty seconds, your wild soul need not bristle at this one moment of holy pause. Let your walls down. This is the safest pit stop you can find. This is a prayer for the empty gas tank, for the mountain peak and the first day of summer. This is a prayer for the enthusiasts, the ones who live their lives with a perpetual exclamation point, who chase the next high with a butterfly net and eat adrenaline for breakfast. This is a prayer for the cheerleaders, for the board game kings and the road trip queens, for the one person party planning committee and their ever growing guest list. This is a prayer for the ones who make friends everywhere they go, for the keeper of the ox cord, for the grand marshal of the dance floor. This is a prayer of celebration for the joy you paint on the canvas of our lives. You can do wonders with orange and yellow and gold, but you don't need to fear the blues of human existence. And you don't need to be the only one holding a paintbrush. You don't need to turn yourself into a parade for our entertainment. Sadness is not a cage from which anger is the only escape. Sadness is just one room in a mansion of emotions where none of the doors have locks. You. With the hopscotch heart trying so hard to blossom without roots. You were not put on this earth to shine so bright and burn so hot that every tear on your face dries before it even has the chance to fall. Your wings are waterproof, and a swim in the ocean from time to time might feel like cheating on the sky, but God called both of them good. The highest high is not at war with the lowest low. This is an elegy for every time you fell down and someone told you to just walk it off. The part of you that was hurting, the part of you that wanted to cry, the part of you that felt pain and fear, it buried itself so deep into the soil of your soul, tunneling its way into the very core of your being. Don't you see God standing there with her gardening gloves, with her shovel, ready to excavate your layers and unearth the child with the scraped knees and bruised elbows. You will never get to witness an empty tomb until you roll away the stone and allow all the things you buried in it to die the chance to walk out. This is a homecoming prayer for every prodigal child who wandered away from their inheritance in search of something greater. Your invitation to the heavenly banquet is written on your calendar in pencil just in case something better comes up. But commitment is not a cage from which apathy is the only escape. There's a carpool on its way over right now. The playlist has already been made. The disco ball is spinning. The pizza rolls are in the oven. You are invited to come just as you are. You don't need to bring the party because the party is already here. There's no bouncer who will only let you in if you are funny enough, happy enough, strong enough, enough. Sometimes you are flying, sometimes you are falling, and every now and then you can land, you can settle in, you can say yes, you can say no, you are free. On the night Jesus was arrested, he gathered with his closest friends in the world for one more dinner party until his resurrection. 
At the end of the meal, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, friends, broken for you. Every time you do this, remember me. In the same way, he took the cup, he poured it out, and he blessed it, saying, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of every sin. Every time you do this, remember me. For every time we eat this bread and we drink this, this cup, we are invited to remember that we are able to live the fullness of our lives here and now and until the revolution comes, when Jesus will come to wipe away every tear and death and mourning will be no more. Friends, you're invited at this moment to tear off a piece of your bread item as large as you understand God's grace for you to be, which means take a lot, to dip it into the cup and to eat this abundant life waiting for you, knowing that this is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ poured out for you. Friends, everything has been made ready at this dinner party. The only thing that is missing is you. So come, let us eat together.
We got a couple of great announcements for you here this afternoon. The first of which is we would love for you to check out our BSM Faith Community Spotify account if that's your thing. Uh, we have been creating these amazing uh, playlists for each of the UR series Enneagram types. Uh, we think you would really like it. So if you're looking for a way to be thinking of BSM during the week, go check that out. You are invited to join us for our virtual coffee hour right after worship around 5 o'clock or so Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to come and join us, to pop in, to tell us how you're doing, uh, to see some other folks in the community and discuss the service as you'd like. We want you to know that our podcast small group is going to be gathering not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, April 22nd, uh, and we'll be listening together and discussing the Dan Koch episode, which is episode 149. The episode is entitled, The End Times and American Christian Culture. Uh, American culture is pretty obsessed with apocalyptic things, and so it should be a really insightful conversation and uh, series. If you'd like to tune in, we would love to have you join us. We also invite you to check out the rest of the announcements in the bulletin. At this time, we want to remember that in the abundance of life and our desire to drink up as much of life as possible, we also have the ability to be generous and to be extravagantly generous. There are many ways that we can offer of ourselves in this BSM community. One way you can offer of yourself is by vulnerably sharing your prayers with this community, uh, trusting that there will be people in this community praying for you and for the situations in your life. You can do that by filling out the prayer Google form below. You can also offer of yourself by introducing yourself to the community or reintroducing yourself to the community, telling us who you are and how you might be able to or might be interested in getting more involved with this community. You can do that by filling out the Google form below as well. And then finally, you can give of yourself by giving of your money. This is a weekly practice that we do to remember that life is not just for our drinking and devouring up, but it is also uh, an invitation for us to enter into the freedom of a relationship and that there is real power in letting go and not just holding on to what is ours and ours alone. So friends, however you're feeling called to give of yourself, we would love to have you do that now. Your tithes and offerings will now be received. The good news of this day is that we friends are free to commit ourselves to God and to one another and to the fullness of who we are. It's really good news. As we strive to share that good news with one another, I charge you to go out into this day and to be of good courage, to hold fast unto all that is good, to render unto no one evil for evil, Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, and honor all of God's people even as we love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. We are going to close things out here by doing this sacred Christian practice that has been practiced for millennia now. Uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Vanderkoop, who is very much the most Enneagram 7 person I've ever met. He is this massive personality and also just a tall dude, and so you sense his presence and his energy wherever he goes. He is going to invite us uh, to pass the peace with one another and share what peace looks like to him in his high energy, adrenaline seeking life. And then and because we're talking about freedom, we're going to close things out with Beyonce's freedom because it feels right. Friends, it was so beautiful to worship with you. Thanks for coming back this Sunday after Easter. We will see you next week, next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll see you soon. Peace. Bye. Hi. My name is Jeff Vanderkoop, and I'm here in British Columbia, Canada. I know Laura from Haddonfield, New Jersey. Uh, we were both on the staff there at Haddonfield Prez, and I feel privileged to be here um, sharing about the Enneagram 7 and what passing the peace means to me. Enneagram 7 is about adventure and reframing things and a lot of action 
And then I'm an extrovert, a huge extrovert. And so I seek it out all the time. So I'm passing the piece comes around in a service for me. It's about engaging as many people as possible. Um, some Sundays it actually might be a game, an adventure, let's say. But I work with the youth and I notice lots of people coming in and out. Uh, I pay attention to faces and I notice the smiles and sadness and stress and worry and concern. And so when it comes to passing the peace, my mind is racing and it's all over the place. And I'm trying to think, how can I get to that person and, and shake their hand? How can I give a hug to this person, a good handshake, a pat on the back? How can I engage a youth in a meaningful way? And maybe to you, that doesn't sound very peaceful. Maybe all that action and craziness and lots of thought and action and adventure doesn't sound peaceful. But the truth is that in some of the maddest times of my life, whether it's 110 kids yelling and screaming all for lunch when I was running a program, I found peace in the moment of one six-year-old asking me if her hands were clean enough to eat lunch. Or just before jumping out of an airplane, I found peace in the idea that I was going to jump out of an airplane at 3,000 feet. So somehow in the midst of running around and doing things, I find Christ's peace. So when people tell me that they pray and they meditate and they love moments of silence, to be honest with you, that freaks me out. I get a cold chill down my back. And I don't know what to do. But the idea of moving through a sanctuary and greeting people that I can see in their face that they need to be greeted eye to eye, heart to heart, I tell you, I find peace. I know my wife, Nadia, did this a couple weeks ago and she talked about this peace of Christ not under, surpassing all understanding. And I agree. I don't quite understand the peace of Christ, but in moments of madness and lots of adventure, I've often found some of the greatest sense of peace. So the beauty of this morning is that we're all going to be able to do that right now. So I want to encourage you to text, share in a chat, or even just say out loud the peace of Christ to you. And wait. And pause. And feel the peace of Christ descend on you. Because in this beautiful community, there's lots of people who care and who love you and who are offering the peace of Christ to you today. So from us here in British Columbia, peace of Christ to you. Forgive me, I've been running, running blind in truth. I'm a rain, I'm a rain on this bit of love. But tell the sweet I'm new. I'm telling these tears gonna fall away, fall away. May the last one burn into flames. I'm a wave, I'm a wave through the waters. 
Tell the tide don't move I'm a right, I'm a right through your borders Call me bulletproof Lord forgive me, I've been running Running blind in truth I'm a way, I'm a way through your shadow love Tell the deep I'm new I'm telling these tears gonna fall away, fall away May the last one burn into flames Freedom, freedom, I can't move Freedom, cut me loose, yeah Freedom, freedom, where are you? Cause I need freedom too I break chains all by myself Well, let my freedom ride in hell Hey, yeah, I'ma keep running Cause when winner don't quit on themselves Keep running cause the winner don't quit on himself